Eric Byrne established transactional analysis in the late 1950s as a psychological theory and therapeutic strategy. Byrne thought that our childhood experiences had a huge impact on our lives as adults, especially when it came to parenting. The psychoanalytic theory of Sigmund Freud, which contends that childhood experiences can influence personality development and emotional difficulties, had an impact on him. According to Byrne's thesis, dysfunctional conduct is the outcome of self-limiting decisions made as a kid, known as the life script. Transactional analysis psychotherapy seeks to alter this life script, allowing people to rewrite their stories and live more satisfying lives. Other experts, such as Thomas Harris and Claude Steiner, have helped shape transactional analysis. We can obtain greater knowledge of human behavior and help people lead more meaningful and harmonious lives by grasping the complexity of transactional analysis and its varied uses. Now, we will be exploring a fundamental aspect of transactional analysis known as the ego states. According to transactional analysis, during our interactions, we operate from one of three ego states. The child ego state, the parent ego state, or the adult ego state. These states influence how we act, react, and communicate with others. Several factors influence the ego state in which we find ourselves during an interaction. Our upbringing and conditioning play a significant role in shaping our default patterns of behavior and reactions. Past traumas can also influence how we respond in specific situations, and the ego state of the person we are interacting with can impact our own state as well. Interacting from the child's or parent's ego state often occurs unconsciously or as a default response. However, it requires conscious awareness to shift into the adult ego state and interact from a more balanced and objective standpoint. Let's begin by discussing the child's ego state. This state has two subdivisions, the adapted child and the free child. When we operate from the child ego state, we tend to respond based on the emotional experiences and conditioning we had during childhood. It's like reverting back to the thinking and feeling patterns we had when we were younger. The child ego state is formed through the reinforcements, whether positive or negative, that we received in childhood. These reinforcements continue to shape and influence our interactions today. The adapted child state is characterized by conforming to others' expectations and desires to seek approval and likability. However, it also has a rebellious side, which emerges when faced with perceived conflicts, leading to responses of resistance, hostility, and emotional reactivity. On the other hand, the free child ego state can be described as creative, spontaneous, playful, and pleasure-seeking. It represents our ability to express ourselves authentically, without the constraints of societal expectations or past conditioning. Now, let's turn our attention to the parent's ego state, which also has two subdivisions, the critical, controlling parent and the nurturing parent. The parent ego state encompasses the learned behaviors and thought patterns we acquired from our interactions with parents and other authority figures during our upbringing. According to Byrne, our experiences in the first five years of life contribute significantly to the parent ego state. Evaluations and judgments, frequently accompanied by words like, should, and, should not, characterize this state. It reflects the influence of our parents or authority figures in shaping our beliefs about how things should be. When we operate from a critical or controlling parent state, we tend to disapprove of and criticize others in a harsh and possibly aggressive manner. In contrast, the nurturing parent state emerges when we try to take control of a situation in a more caretaking or rescuing manner, often attempting to soothe others. However, it's essential to note that this can be inappropriate when interacting with other adults instead of children. Lastly, we have the adult ego state, which stands apart from the other two states as it does not have any subdivisions. When we operate from the adult ego state, we engage with people and our environment in the present moment without being influenced by past conditioning or external influences. The adult ego state is characterized by openness, rationality, and a tendency to avoid making hasty judgments about situations or individuals. When communication occurs in the adult state, we are more likely to be respectful, open-minded, willing to compromise, and capable of engaging in healthy social interactions. Understanding these ego states and recognizing which state we are operating from can greatly enhance our self-awareness and improve our interactions with others. 
It allows us to consciously choose to respond rather than react based on past conditioning. As we progress in our study of transactional analysis, we will explore practical applications of these ego states and how they impact our relationships and personal growth. We discuss the different ego states and how they influence our interactions. Now, we will delve deeper into how these ego states interact and affect communication. Transactional analysis recognizes that people require strokes, which are units of interpersonal recognition, to thrive and grow. Understanding how we give and receive positive and negative strokes, as well as changing unhealthy stroking patterns, is a vital aspect of transactional analysis work. One of the key goals of transactional analysis is to foster adult-to-adult -adult communication, which leads to the most effective and healthy interactions and relationships with others. Now, let's explore the different types of transactions that occur in communication. First, we have complementary transactions. Please note that although the term, complementary transactions, may sound positive, it doesn't always imply healthy communication. Complementary transactions occur when the ego state of the sender aligns with the ego state of the receiver. In this type of transaction, the sender's communication reaches the desired ego state of the receiver, resulting in a response that complements the sender's ego state instead of challenging it. When complementary transactions occur between two individuals in an adult-to-adult -adult state, it is considered the most favorable form of communication. It fosters respect and reduces conflicts. However, if a complementary transaction takes place between the child ego state of one person and the nurturing parent ego state of the other, it may temporarily reduce conflicts and create a sense of harmony. For example, in a marriage, if one partner is worried about an event, the other may adopt a nurturing parental state to provide comfort and support. While this can be helpful in certain situations, over time, it may strain the relationship and become draining. Next, we have cross-border transactions. Cross-transactions occur when the ego states of two individuals interacting do not match. The sender's ego state fails to reach the intended ego state of the respondent, leading to a conflicting response. In a cross-transaction, one or both individuals must shift their ego states for the communication to continue. For instance, imagine a customer approaching you, using belittling language, and expressing anger over a recent purchase. They are speaking from their critical parent state, expecting you to respond from your child's ego state. However, if you choose to respond from your adult or parent state instead, it would create a cross-transaction, requiring one or both parties to adjust their ego states to maintain effective communication. Transactional analysis suggests that responding from the adult ego state increases the likelihood of the sender also returning to their adult state, enabling communication to progress from adult to adult. This fosters healthier and more respectful interactions. Lastly, we have ulterior transactions. Ulterior transactions occur when the sender outwardly gives a message that appears to come from their adult ego state to the receiver's adult ego state. However, there is an underlying, subtle message from the sender's child or parent state intended to be received by the responder's child or parent state. This creates the simultaneous delivery of two messages. An example of an ulterior transaction would be if a teacher or friend says, you can choose to study subjects that lead to becoming a doctor. However, it is very hard and requires lots of intelligence. On the surface, it appears to be adult-to-adult -adult communication with a subtle warning. However, the sender may have said it with the intention of triggering the receiver's rebellious child ego state, leading them to think, I'll show you that I am intelligent and can become a doctor, and thus motivating them to study harder. It's important to note that these different transactions in communication are not solely defined by verbal language and words. They also encompass tone of voice, body language, and facial expressions. Understanding these transactional patterns can help us become more aware of our own ego states and the impact they have on our interactions. It allows us to make conscious choices about how we communicate with others, fostering healthier and more effective relationships. As with any theory or approach, it's important to consider both its strengths and limitations. Let's begin with the advantages of transactional analysis. One of the primary advantages of transactional analysis is its straightforward nature. Its creator, Eric Byrne, intended for it to be easily understandable, with concepts that can be grasped by the layperson. 
This accessibility allows individuals to comprehend the theory and gain insights into how social interactions in their lives take shape. Furthermore, transactional analysis facilitates deeper self-awareness. It helps people gain insight into their own behaviors, reactions, thoughts, and emotions that may have previously gone unnoticed. This increased self-awareness provides individuals with a valuable tool for personal growth. Another advantage of transactional analysis is its positive impact on communication skills and relationships. By applying the principles of transactional analysis, individuals can enhance their ability to communicate effectively and develop healthier relationships. Current research supports the benefits of transactional analysis in improving communication and reducing conflicts. Lastly, transactional analysis is a versatile theory that can be applied to various social environments and relationships. Whether it's in the workplace, between colleagues and managers, teacher-student interactions in schools, romantic relationships and marriage, families, parent-child relationships, or dealing with difficult clients across different industries, transactional analysis offers valuable insights and tools. Its adaptability makes it applicable in numerous contexts. Now, let's turn our attention to the disadvantages of transactional analysis. One drawback is that transactional analysis requires individuals to possess a certain level of self-awareness. It necessitates the capacity to observe and notice one's own behavior, emotions, and thought patterns. However, not everyone may possess this level of self-awareness, which could hinder their engagement with transactional analysis. Moreover, transactional analysis relies on the willingness and motivation of the individual to take ownership of their problems and behaviors. It requires active participation and a genuine commitment to personal growth. As a result, transactional analysis may not be suitable for everyone, particularly those who are not ready or willing to take on this level of self-reflection. Additionally, although Byrne originally intended for transactional analysis to be straightforward and simple to understand, subsequent contributions from psychotherapists and psychologists have expanded and elaborated on the theory. This has resulted in a more complex framework, deviating somewhat from its original intended simplicity. It's important to recognize both the advantages and disadvantages of transactional analysis as we explore its applications and consider its effectiveness in various contexts. This balanced perspective allows us to critically evaluate its suitability and potential limitations. That concludes our discussion. I encourage you to reflect on these points and consider how they may impact their application. If you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to share them.